Have you ever wondered why some people seem to have every advantage in life to succeed, and yet they somehow manage to sabotage their success, and they destroy any chance at happiness? And then there are those who seem to have every disadvantage thrown their way, yet they persevere with an unstoppable attitude to succeed regardless of their circumstances. And the thing that really amazes me about these people is that they make choices to enjoy themselves during the entire process. What you are about to experience here today, folks, is not brain surgery, it's brain adjustment. Okay, I'm offering you common sense success strategies that will not only take you to a better place in your business, but in life. And in my view, when these two are in sync, working together, that is the ultimate success. These strategies are based on three principles. Number one, you have to know without a doubt, regardless of your circumstances, that you are the creator of your success and happiness. Number two, you are the only problem that you will ever have. And somewhere within you, there is a solution waiting to be discovered. Number three, whenever you're confronted with a challenge or problem of any kind, it's never a matter of managing the situation. It's always a matter on how you manage the situation. Can you manage your thoughts and your emotions that are trying to keep you from finding that solution that's waiting to be discovered? The most important lesson that I've learned from living on this planet, and trust me when I say I learned it the hard way, is what truly successful, happy, optimistic people know about life in a very profound way. They know without a doubt that they become what they think about day in and day out. They are well aware that the thoughts that they have about the challenges in their life will ultimately determine the quality of success and happiness they're going to have in regards to those challenges. Contrary to what a lot of people may think, it's really not the situation, the circumstance, the event that takes place in our lives that determines our quality of life. It's how we think about these things. Why? Because your thoughts have the incredible power to either minimize or maximize the effect that any specific challenge has on your life. And it's not your thoughts within themselves that gives them great power, it's what they create. Your thoughts will create the beliefs that you have about any challenge. As a matter of fact, the beliefs you have about anything in your life are formulated over a period of time through a consistent way of thinking. Your thoughts create your beliefs. And guess what? Your beliefs write the story of your life. Now this cycle continues because those thoughts and beliefs will also create the way that you feel on any given day. Now this is really important, especially if you want to start your day with an unstoppable attitude to succeed. Because if you want to do that, you have to make sure that you're feeling good during the process. Now, as simplistic as that may sound, I'm telling you, this is not only a major key to your success and happiness, but the way that you feel on any given day is at the core of your success and happiness. Why? Because feeling good is the fuel that drives motivation and inspiration. You should write that down, go home, and slap it on your refrigerator. Feeling good is the fuel that drives motivation and inspiration. Think about it. It is absolutely impossible to stay motivated throughout the day if you are harboring negative emotions or if you have a bad attitude during the process. The number one reason why people consistently fail in business and in life, the reason why any one of you may be having a tough time handling a particular challenge or trying to achieve a goal, it's not because you're not smart enough. It's because you got caught up somewhere along the way, positive momentum ceases, usually without the individual realizing what's happening. And the reason why positive momentum ceases is because the individual is focusing all of their energy on what isn't working and all the things that need to be done in order to get it to work. And they're not leaving any room at all in that brain of theirs for positive thoughts or optimistic thoughts to seep through so that they can come up with healthier alternatives and find the solution that's waiting to be discovered. Feeling good is the fuel that drives motivation. Now I'm looking at you all right now and I know what you're saying and I know what a lot of you are thinking, okay Steve, that makes sense. Our feelings are at the core of our success and happiness. But Steve, how do you feel good when you're not feeling good? How do you do that? What do you do when it seems like on any particular day life seems to be throwing stuff at you at every direction? That's a great question. I believe I have the answer. 
This common sense success strategy, folks, I really want you to get this. Because this whole process starts as soon as you open up your eyes to greet the day. As soon as you open up your eyes to greet the day, you enter into consciousness. It is at that moment that your creativity is at its most powerful. At that moment, when you open up your eyes before you take the covers off, you have an incredible opportunity to steer your thoughts and your emotions in the direction that you want them to go, not in the direction they are so often telling you to go. In other words, you could really choose to seize the day or you could let the day seize you. I think we could all agree that way too many people today, especially today, are starting their days off in low moods at best. And you want to know what the danger is here? They're not even aware of what they're doing to themselves. They've been doing it so long, it has become a part of their personality. And the reason why they're doing this is that as soon as they open up their eyes, they didn't take the covers off, they're thinking about all the things that, that aren't working in their lives. They're focusing on the challenging, if not the grueling day that they had the day before, the fires that won't put out, the irate people that they had to deal with, the traffic jam that they're gonna be in. Again, man, I know people, and I bet you a lot of people in this room do this. You wake up, you didn't take the covers off, you're still half asleep, and you reach over to your nightstand, and you grab your iPhone or some other apparatus, and you start looking at all of the messages that you believe need to be answered before you even leave the house. That is insane. Give me a break. Give yourself a break. And then what do you start doing? You start thinking about all the stuff that has to be done on that coming day. And now you can't understand why when you're going to work after you just had four cups of coffee, your energy level is down here. <laughs> Look, I'm looking at some people. They're going, how does he know this? <laughs> what, is he in my room for crying out loud? <clears throat> Think of your responsibilities on any given day. Your energy level has to be cranked. That's your choice and your responsibility. So what I'm asking you to do is to get your shift together. Okay, notice what I said, get your shift together. In other words, when you wake up in the morning, rather than focusing on what isn't working and all the things that need to be done and boggling up your brain, I want you in those few moments, before you take, even take the covers off, I want you to allow yourself to shift your focus and your way of thinking to the things that are working to the things that bring you joy, to the thing that lifts your spirit, to the things that gradually make you feel better. What I'm asking you to do here, folks, in those few moments, this only takes 30 seconds to a minute to do. If you do it for three weeks, every morning, you will have created a totally different habit. And all I'm asking you to do is to create an attitude of gratitude or an attitude of appreciation. And it doesn't matter who or what it is. Think of your loved ones. Maybe as soon as you open up your eyes, you're thinking of the person lying next to you. Maybe you're thinking of your children. Maybe you're thinking of your grandchildren, the dog lying by the side of the bed. Maybe you're noticing the sun rising through your window and you're appreciating that beautiful scene. Maybe you're having people over for company on a Saturday evening for dinner. Maybe you're watching a sporting event on Sunday or you're going on vacation somewhere. Maybe somebody did something nice for you or you did something nice for somebody. It doesn't matter who or what it is. Everyone in this room, can think of something that they're grateful for, that they appreciate. And what I'm asking you to do in those few moments is to hold on to that stuff and let it build. Notice how you start feeling. Now, why do I want you to do this? Because an attitude of gratitude simply makes you feel good. And what is feeling good? It's the fuel that drives motivation and inspiration. We go through the course of our lives and we allow people, situations, circumstances, and events to literally, literally suck the energy right out of us. That's because we don't know that we have these innate common sense success strategies within, within us that could meet these challenges head on. And, what, and I'm telling you that you do. It's there. It's just that we get so caught up in the stuff of life, we don't realize we can tap into this part of ourselves. And another strategy, that can help you to feel good throughout the day, every day, 365 days a year, is for you to unleash the power of your humor being on a daily basis. Everyone on this planet is born with a humor being within them. Unfortunately, most people go their entire lives never knowing they have this power within them, let alone how to tap into it and make it work for them. 
Your humor being, folks, is a part of you that brings out the best in you when times get really tough. What your humor being can give you more than anything else is emotional stability. I did stand-up comedy for over 20 years. I headline comedy clubs, theaters, colleges, throughout the country. I'm not saying any of this to impress upon you, to, to impress you, but to impress upon you that every single time I was on that stage, I was well aware that there were people in the audience experiencing some really tough times. Maybe they were going through a divorce, having financial difficulties, maybe they or a loved one were in inflicted with some kind of illness. But for those few hours at the comedy club, their challenges, their problems didn't own them. Why? Because they simply allowed themselves to take time out to laugh. Laughter is the pit stop in the right race of life and that it gives you enough emotional fuel and repairs to get back into the race again. But the initiative and the proficiency by which we allow ourselves to laugh comes from what I call your humor being. And that's a key phrase, you have to allow yourself to do it. As a matter of fact, follow me on this true story that took place in the middle of my comedy career where my humor being came to the rescue and turned a totally stressful situation totally around into the ultimate success story just because of my ability to allow myself to laugh. Follow me on this. I was in New York City. That sets it up right there. <laughs> Anybody here from New York? New York? Where in New York are you from? New York City. You know Tony? <laughs> He's like, you moron, I am Tony. <laughs> so I was in New York City. I had a rental car that kept breaking down. 98 degrees, air conditioning isn't working, sweats pouring over my entire body. The car keeps stalling out and starting again. But to make it even worse, it seemed like every New Yorker in the world was beeping their horns and cursing at me. That is not a secure feeling at all. And I'm already 20 minutes late for a very important audition. And I'm feeling this massive snowball of negativity building up. And I'm like, oh, man, what else could possibly happen? Don't ever ask that question. <laughs> See, because if you do, the universe will answer you. And it did. I drive up to the toll booth, and I went to pay the guy. And I realized I left my wallet at the rental place. I don't know what possessed me. I looked at the guy, and I said, I'll have a couple of burgers, two fries, and get something for yourself there, Sparky. <laughs> This guy looks at me with the biggest grin on his face and with the biggest New York attitude and says, hey, you want me to supersize those fries there, tough guy? <laughs> so we both started laughing, but the cars in back of me, they're not laughing at all. I mean, they're going, come on, what, let's get going. We got to get moving. What's going on over there? My newfound friend in the toll booth, this guy was crazy. He sticks his head out of the booth, motions to all of the other cars and says, hey, Calm down, we ran out of food. Try the next booth, try the next booth. <laughs> By then, we were laughing really hard. We high-fived each other. You want, you want to know what the coolest thing was? He let me go without pain. He looked at me and he said, hey, looks like you're having a tough time here, pal. Don't worry about it, I got you covered. This toll is on me. And get out of here and have a good day. And by the way, thank you. I looked at him and said, why are you thanking me? He goes, you need to understand, I'm pretty new in this area. This is only my second day on this stupid job, and believe me when I tell you I really needed to laugh today. <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, so did I. <laughs> Folks, here's my point, and a very important point. I drove away from that toll booth in a totally different state of mind. Totally different state of mind. As a result, I was able to plant positive thoughts in my head, constructive ways on how I can deal with this very important audition that I had coming up. And guess what? I had a great audition. I kicked butt. It's a good thing I did. Led to the most important break of my comedy career. That's how I got my first TV special, my Showtime special. That special paved the way for every other TV special that I was ever on. Now let me ask you this question. What do you think would have happened if I would have gone into that audition in the mood that I was in before the toll booth incident? I wouldn't have had a chance. Not in the mood that I was in. And I tried everything in my power to turn it around. And I realized years later, when I looked back, I said, what was it that helped me to turn this around? And I realized it's only when I started laughing. Why is that? Here's the psychology behind this. When you allow yourself to laugh in the midst of a very stressful situation like that, your brain is no longer focusing on that stressful situation. It can't. Your brain can only focus on one thing at a time. 
Right now your brain is laughing at something ridiculous or absurd that just happened. And even if your brain does go back to that stressful situation, it won't be as overwhelming as it was before. Why? Because you've calmed your nervous system down to the point where you are in somewhat control of the situation rather than having the situation control you. At that moment in my life, my humor being came to the rescue and in a matter of seconds, not minutes, seconds, there was a major shift in my attitude. But we have to allow it to happen. We have to allow it. We have to unleash this power of our humor being on a daily basis. And, and when you do, you'll notice things start changing. You start feeling better. Start looking around. There's humor everywhere. How many married people out there? Married people? Oh, come on, there's humor there. Can you people look a little bit more enthusiastic? <laughs> I, I said married people, oh yeah, okay. Come on, there's humor in marriage. As a matter of fact, I believe that a sense of humor is, a, is crucial for a healthy marriage, don't you? Yeah, but I read an article in Oprah Magazine where the author said that the key to a healthy marriage is to very simply understand your partner. Are you kidding me? Have you ever tried to do that? Man or woman? Folks, come on. You'll never be able to understand your partner. The only thing that you have to understand about your partner is that there are things about your partner that you will never understand. And if you could understand that, you will have a better understanding. Do you understand? <laughs> come on, I was, I, I, I've been married to my wife for over 30 years. To this day, I can't understand why I have to get in trouble for dreams that she has. <laughs> right? Guys, you know what I'm talking about. You wake up, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, and you're going, man, what a beautiful day. And she looks at you and says, well, maybe it was a beautiful day for you, Casanova. <laughs> and you're like, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? What's wrong? You want to know what's wrong? I just had a dream that you were flirting with a woman. Guys, your response should never be, really? What'd she look like? <laughs> yeah, I just want to know if it's the same dream I've been having, that's all. <laughs> it's everywhere. Humor is everywhere. Allow yourself to see it. You know your stress level and how things can bombard you every single day. How many people have children? Come on, children are the funniest people on the face of the planet. Take advantage of it. The best thing about having kids is watching your kids grow up to be just like you. I love it. I love it. My son thinks he's a comedian. Now, he's hysterical, but when he was in elementary school, we had a problem because he didn't know when to stop. He kept making people laugh, and he was disrupting the class. He was getting in trouble. That's because he actually kept thinking he was on stage performing. One time he came home from school. I said, hey, how was school? He said, good crowd, good crowd. <laughs> I said, don't get smart with me. He said, don't worry. I don't want to confuse you. Another, th another thing that could make you feel good throughout the day, and, I, and this is so simple, do something nice for somebody. And do that, especially when you're in a low mood. We all get in those low moods. You just do something nice for somebody, and all of a sudden it elevates your morale, your spirit. Have you ever done it? Just holding up like a door for someone or an elevator when someone's trying to come get on, or you're carrying a heavy load for someone, a package or something. You ever notice how good you feel? So if you're walking through town, for instance, and you see a parking summons on someone's windshield, go up to that car, rip that sucker up, and throw it away. <laughs> Why should that person have to pay for that? And you feel so much better. Do you see how much better you feel right now that you're laughing? Give you says a big round of applause for that, too. You see how much better you feel? That's my point. It's there. It's everywhere. Take advantage of it. And you know what? You know what else laughter does? It helps you to enjoy the process. It helps you to enjoy the process. And if feeling good is the fuel that drives motivation and inspiration, then enjoyment shifts motivation into high gear. Studies have shown that people will make a conscious choice every day to enjoy themselves during the process of whatever it is that they are trying to achieve are more creative, they're more productive, they're able to bounce back a lot faster from life's challenges, and they're able to find solutions to problems a lot quicker. Now, having said that, I'm going to say this. The biggest inspiration in my life is my brother Michael. He's the number one reason why I do what I do today. No one has taught me more on how to embrace these common sense success strategies more than he has. 
in, in my view and everyone else's view that knows him, he is the mark of a true leader. Biggest inspiration of my life. He's 100% disabled as a result of the Vietnam War. He is the only man, as far as they know, in medical history that ever survived that kind of wound. He's in medical journals as someone who beat the odds. 21 feet of his small intestine were either blown out on the battlefield or taken out on the operating table, and parts of his other internal organs were damaged as well. Now, the only reason why I am being graphic here is that I want you to understand what he went through so you could appreciate how he beat this. And I'll never forget the first time that I saw him in St. Albans Naval Hospital in Queens, New York. If it hadn't been for my mom and dad in the room with him, I never would have known it was him. He went from 168 pounds to 93 pounds. And in the room with my mom and dad were his two friends from high school and his Marine Corps buddy whom he was in Vietnam with. And the whole day my brother was going in and out of consciousness. And it was at the end of that day when the doctor walked in and looked at my mom and dad and said, I'm sorry, it doesn't look like he's gonna make it. You better start making arrangements. I'll never forget the look on my mom and dad's face. His two friends from high school walked out of the room. His Marine Corps buddy just faced the wall and kept saying why to no one in particular. He just kept saying why. And all these thoughts are going through my head now. I remember I was standing right next to my brother as he was lying there, and I'm, I'm wondering if this is going to be, I was only 17 years old at the time, and I'm wondering if this is going to be the last time that I'm going to see him, and something very strange is happening, because he's supposed to be unconscious, and I noticed that he's lifting his arm, and he clenched his fist, and then he raised his middle finger, and, <laughs> and he was waving it back and forth. And right then and there, I knew he wasn't going to give up. Why? Because that was his humor being's response to that doctor's diagnosis, and that was a response he gave them every single time they told him he couldn't and wouldn't be able to do something. First, they said he wouldn't live long. Well, they're wrong because he's alive today. Then they said that he would have to eat certain foods because with one foot of small intestine, they didn't think he would be able to handle any kind of food with substance. You want to know what my brother's attitude was? Don't you ever tell me what I'm going to eat. Typical New York attitude. Don't you ever tell me what I'm going to eat. I'm going to eat a bowl of pasta and a couple of meatballs every day, even if I have to shit on the toilet while I'm eating it. <laughs> and he started, weeks went by, months went by, and they started realizing his small intestines started stretching a bit. And he used the rest of his digestive system for what his small intestine could no longer do. Doctors today, today when he goes back for visits, they say what my brother experienced falls nothing short of miraculous. And I know that word miraculous is a very powerful word to use. But if you think about it, sometimes in life, what is a miracle? Nothing but a shift in perception. It's looking at something where at one point you may be saying, oh man, I'm not gonna be able to handle this. This is gonna be impossible. But then if you allow yourself a shift in the way that you're thinking, even a slight shift of optimism, that impossibility suddenly becomes very possible. My brother never said, why me? Till this day, I've never heard him complain. I've never heard him say, why me? And isn't that what we have a tendency to do today, personally and professionally, when we're setting out to achieve something, and then all of a sudden life comes in and attacks you? First thing you say is, why me? Why is this happening? Every single time I try to achieve something, I go two steps up and three steps back. Some people call this negative self-talk. I call it self-curse talk. Why? Because you're casting a spell on your life. When you start spewing out words like that and thinking thoughts like that, you are opening the door to the negative zone and you're inviting more toxic thoughts and words to come into play. Creating a totally different reality for yourself. So, and those words and those thoughts will create the beliefs that you have, you see. And those beliefs will lead you to feel emotionally distraught feeling victimized. Those feelings will lead to the actions that you take. The actions that you take will lead you to the outcome. Folks, you don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a genius to know that that's not gonna be a very positive outcome. So my brother never said, why me? He said, this is me. This is what happened to me. What do I have to do to turn this around? Who can I go to that can help me? 
What needs to be done for me to get from here to there? What strategies, what steps do I need to take to live, to live the life that I desire and I deserve? This is gonna to be tough, but I'm gonna meet this challenge head on, and I know there's something within me that's going to make this work. You see the difference in that mindset? See, those type of words, those type of thoughts solidified a very empowering belief system. Those beliefs caused him to feel victorious, gave him feelings of faith, of hope, determination, optimism. Those beliefs created an unstoppable attitude to succeed regardless of his circumstances. That led eventually to the actions that he took, and that led to an incredible outcome. Another thing my brother did, and if he was here, he would tell you this, he sensed the importance of enjoying himself during the rebuilding process. In other words, he didn't sit there and go, how can I enjoy myself the way I am? Or I'll enjoy myself if and when I get better. He said, no, I'm going to enjoy myself during this process, and it wasn't always easy, but as a result of creating that mindset, it helped him to get better. And you say, how did he do it? How did he enjoy himself in that condition? By focusing on what was working rather than fixating on what isn't working. By blessing the things that life has given him rather than cursing what life has taken from him. By being totally grateful for the people that he loved and loved him. We all have the power to do this. He also sensed the importance of finding the laughter in between and even during the tough times. He had an uncanny way of knowing sometimes a couple of seconds is all you need before you decide to give up. Laughter, your humor being, gives you that couple of seconds every single time. So it's like I said when I first came up here. Folks, you truly are the creators of your success and happiness. You truly are the only problem that you will ever have. And somewhere within you is a solution waiting to be discovered. And whenever you're confronted with a challenge or a problem, regardless of the severity, it's never a matter of managing the situation. It's a matter of managing your mind. Can you manage your mind and the toxic thoughts and emotions that are trying to keep you from discovering that solution that's waiting to be discovered? My brother was in the hospital for seven months. When he got out, he said he was going to go to college and we didn't think he'd do it. He was 95 pounds because he wasn't Mr. Whiz Kid in high school, first of all. But he did go to college. He graduated with degrees in history, administration, and education. He went back to the same school that he graduated from, and he became a history teacher. Then he became an attendance officer. Then he became an assistant principal. Then he was principal. Then when he wanted to retire, they said, no, we won't let you. And they made him superintendent of the entire school system. Biggest, in thank you. I'll take that applause for him. Biggest inspiration of my life. Now I know you're looking at me right now and you're saying, gee, Steve, that's a great story, but what does that have to do with us? Nothing, I just had some time to kill and I thought maybe, <laughs> I don't even have a brother, but anyway. I was. <laughs> no, the moral of this story, folks, is that it's not, it's not what happens to you that determines how successful and how happy you're going to be. It's what you do about what happens. It's the choices you make. It's the thoughts that you have about the challenge that will formulate the belief and the attitude that you have that makes the difference. It's the thoughts that you have that will create a certain way that you feel that makes the difference. Will you challenge yourself to enjoy yourself during the process of whatever it is you're trying to achieve and will you dare to find the laughter in between and even during the tough times? Folks, I just gave you just a few of my common sense success strategies. I can only give them to you. It's up to you as to whether you use them or not. I hope I was able to help. You've been an excellent audience. Thank you for your energy and for your attention. Thank you.